I, I am indeed Evan Smith, the CEO and co-founder of the Texas Tribune. It is an honor to be here. We are in the middle of a three-event series. This is event two of three, so we're literally in the middle. Uh, events that are discussions at the intersection of business and public policy, politics, and government. And so I'll introduce our distinguished guest in a second. We were here in uh, the fall of last year with Marvin Odom, the former global chairman of the Shell Oil Company, who a year before that had left to take an unpaid position with the city of Houston as the city's Hurricane Harvey recovery czar. To talk about how his transition from the business world to the world of, of, uh, of policy and government had been going and that incredibly important exercise to rebuild. We'll have a third event that we're gonna announce uh, here very soon. Um, Pearson and Blue Cross Blue Shield are generous supporters of this event. We thank them for their sponsorship. And any of you in the room who are members of the Texas Tribune, we are a public media organization. Member dollars are a big part of the way that we have done amazing, game-changing journalism for more than nine years. You know that Amplify uh, Austin is today, starting at 6 o'clock, a day of giving. We certainly encourage you to become members of the Tribune at all times, but especially on this giving day, we encourage you to be generous to us, but also to a number of extraordinary causes that are out there raising money. Please make Austin better in the course of uh, doing that. And we have folks around uh, the room in the back who are happy to sign you up to be members of the Texas Tribune if you're so inclined. Um, silence your phones if you would. Uh, the hashtag if you'd like to tweet about the event today is TT Events. We'll talk for about 40 minutes. We'll take questions for the last 20 and we'll have you out of here at one o'clock, all right? Now it's my pleasure to introduce our special guest, John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods Market. Mr. Mackey co-founded the supermarket chain in Austin in 1980 after merging his health food store, Safer Way, with the old Clarksville Natural Grocery. The first Whole Foods Market, a little more than 10,000 square feet, opened in the 900 block of North Lamar Boulevard with a staff of 19. Today there are 497 Whole Foods locations in North America and the United Kingdom, and the company is a subsidiary of Amazon, which acquired Whole Foods in 2017 for $13.7 billion. Mr. Mackey is also one of the co-founders of Conscious Capitalism, which takes as its premise that the elevation of humanity is made possible through business practices focused on purpose, culture, stakeholders, and leadership. He's the co-author of two books on the subject, Conscious Capitalism, Liberating the Heroic Spirit of Business, and Be the Solution, How Entrepreneurs and Conscious Capitalists Can Solve All of the World's Problems. A native of Houston, Mr. Mackey attended the University of Texas at Austin and Trinity University in San Antonio. Please welcome John Mackey. Thank you again for making time for us. Good to be with you. Good to see you. Thank you. So I was thinking about this idea of the nexus between business and policy, and I wanted to think about how to begin the conversation so I went back, of course, and re-read around in your books. And in the first book, Conscious Capitalism, this quote jumped out at me. And honestly, when I hit it, I thought, I got it. I know what I want to ask him. So this is a quote from the, from the first book. We need a richer and more ethically compelling narrative to demonstrate to a skeptical world the truth, beauty, goodness, and heroism of free enterprise capitalism. Otherwise, we risk the continued growth of increasingly coercive governments, the corruption of enterprises through crony capitalism and the consequential loss of both our freedom and our prosperity. I thought we would unpack that. Coercive governments, huh? Explain. Explain why governments are coercive? Yes. <laughs> that, may seem, that may seem elemental, but humor me. Well, I mean, governments are, that's what they are. They're a force. I mean, they have the guns. They they don't pull the guns out unless you disobey. Try not paying your taxes and you will find out the government is fundamentally based on force. Anything wrong with paying taxes? No, of course not. Anything wrong with government being in charge? Isn't that what government does? Governs. It gov has that pesky word governance. I'm merely saying it's, I'm merely saying that inherent in government is coercion. I didn't say it was good, bad, yeah. right or wrong. I just said there's coercion. You're jumping to conclusions that are not stated in my statement. Oh, well, that, I'm, I'm a journalist. My job is to jump to conclusions, of course. <laughs> we've glad we've, we got that out. We got it out of the way. Um. We, we've done this before. Um, let, me, let me go a little bit deeper on this. Do you believe that government, as far as it goes, is a force for good? Can it be a force for good? Of course, good? it can be. So, Evan, let me just, you know, 
there's like four or five things I don't like to talk about in public. Um, sex, politics, religion, abortion, or GMOs. <laughs> because when you talk about these subjects in public, yeah. um, you, uh, you unnecessarily polarize people. People, we're, we're very tribalized right. as, as we, we're tribal animals. And so people begin to decide, is this guy in my tribe or is he in the enemy? Right. So I don't really want, if this discussion is going to be primarily about politics, you're going to find me a, a not a very cooperative. Well, it won't be yes. about politics, but it will be about government. I mean, I, I, because I do think one of, the, one of the things that I'm interested in is your view of the degree to which what happens in government, whether it's local or state or federal, impacts the way that you think about your business, do business, whether that enables you to succeed. I can talk or in the most general terms, but I'm probably going to be unsatisfactory because I'm. Uh, I always joke I failed media training like half a dozen times at Whole Foods because people ask me questions. My instinct is to tell the truth, and uh, that gets me in a lot of trouble, and lots of unpleasant headlines that have harmed my company over the years. So my job is not to cause I, you to have unpleasant headlines uh, for sure. So the the media the media training is to bridge to the topic you want to talk about and just ignore the question. Right. That's hard for me to do because I feel like it's kind of rude, uh, but politicians do that all the right. time. So I will try to diffuse the question through humor. That's my basic strategy. I'm which, for that. That's good. So. Or if I'm very uncomfortable with a question, I'm just not going to answer it. Because I'm sensitive to how these things get spun of course. by a media that jumps to conclusions and makes uh, headlines which are not true to what was actually said. Well, the good news is we'll have video of this, and exactly. so people can go back and see what nobody, you actually said. Nobody yeah. goes back and looks yeah. at the video. They just read the headlines. <laughs> right. Well, so, my, so, so in all sincerity, since ca conscious capitalism does pivot off of these ideas that purpose and leadership and stakeholders and culture are so critical... I mean, really what I want to talk about is the degree to which you can control your fate and the fate of any business, not just Whole Foods, but any business you run, by dedicating yourself to these things, by focusing on these things, and how that is the determining factor. I'm much more comfortable talking about business than yeah. I am talking about government. I mean, government can be a force for good, or because it has coercive power, it can also be right. a force for evil. I mean, a lot of governments killed 100 million people in the 20th century alone. So, I mean, governments yeah. are not always good. Right. But I wonder to the degree, uh, Mr. Mackey, that you accept that government will set policy that then, as it migrates down the food chain, lands at your doorstep, this is something that you think about. Not again with regard to party or ideology, yeah. but an, an example might be the regulatory environment. Surely, if you run a business, big or small, but especially big, and government has its hands on the regulatory environment, or an environment that is free of regulation as opposed to one that has more regulation, presumably is more favorable to business. Right. When I retire from Whole Foods Market and people will no longer hurt me by trying to hurt my company, I can talk more openly. But we don't live in that time now. For CEOs to speak out, talk about these issues, um, I've done it. And the, and the price Whole Foods has paid has been a steep one. I'm not willing any longer to have my children beat up because daddy has strong opinions about things. So, uh, Is there anything controversial about believing if you're in business? Uh, that, fine. We yeah. need some regulations in our society. Yeah. That's simple. Now, which ones? Which ones should we have? Well, I wasn't going to ask you about which ones. I was simply going to ask you about the degree to which government, by virtue of having its hands on the regulatory environment, matters or doesn't matter to business. I think we can agree that it does impact business, right? We, sure, we need good regulations. Right. We need fewer bad regulations. I'm not going to talk about what I think are good regulations and bad regulations. That'll be misinterpreted, undoubtedly. Yeah. What about the idea, we're having a conversation, as you know, Mr. Mackey, because although you have a global... Please call me John. John, well... <laughs> Mr. Smith. <laughs> my mother, you know, I'm, I'm assuming your mother raised you properly. I know my mother raised me properly, which is why I call you Mr. Mackey. I'm not Mackey, sure my mother it, felt that way. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh... If I call you John and my mother gets upset, will you send her a note? Sure. Okay, good. Uh, John, because you live in Austin, even though you run a global conglomerate... Uh, you have, have probably no ability to ignore completely what's happening in Austin or at the Capitol. You know that we're having a big conversation about investment in education, not the first time that's happened. One of the reasons that we're having a conversation about investment in education at this moment is that the business community, among others, have stepped up and said the state's growing very quickly. We have a need for a workforce in Texas. We have to be sure that we invest in education to produce the best workforce. 
Does a conversation like that one animate you at all? And, and do you agree with the general premise that investing in education at, at the state level in government is a good thing from the perspective of workforce development? Obviously, education is important, but there's many different ways to educate people. And um, I, I would love, I'd like to, I would love to see more choice and competition. I mean, education is frequently a monopoly of government. And I guess I believe entrepreneurs are, would be better at creating innovations and progress in education, just like they've done in the grocery business. So I'd like to see more competition. And, and more choice. That's kind of where I fall out on the education issue. K kind of an any and all strategy. So I believe competition allows innovations in surprising ways to occur that make progress in society happen. So uh, government obviously has some type of role to play in that. But I, one of the things that has happened is we have not had enough entrepreneurship in education. As a result, the United States does not score well uh, internationally in education. Right. So. I mean, we've got some projects that are going on in, in education. I mean, look at what Jeff, Jeff Sandifer's done with the Acton Institute here in Austin. It started with one school. It was 40. It's, 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 a, it's a wonderful school. And we've got, we've got, those are the kind of things that get me excited about. New alternatives, new creativity, new innovation in education. Yeah. I'm interested to hear you use the word entrepreneur in this context because there is a perception that the business community can teach the public sector ways to do things better and different. That innovation often is it's difficult for innovation to come from inside government, often it has to come from outside government. Government is, is good at what it does, but I'd say entrepreneurship's not one of them. And uh, I think that, that Business is good in entrepreneurship, but we have to be. We have to make money or we die. You have to innovate. You have to, you have to satisfy customers. Right. Um, so that gives entrepreneurs and business sort of a creative edge. And they have more freedom to operate. I mean, it's a little known, a little a story is that I was studying to be a teacher before I started Whole Foods. I was... Um, Tell that story, please. So that story is that uh, I was at Trinity getting a degree in... I was getting a degree in philosophy at UT and a degree in education at Trinity, and I went back and forth multiple times between the two schools. And I was student teaching at, at, at Trinity in San Antonio, and uh, they were giving me the students who couldn't read, and I was teaching those kids how to read. And uh, one day, the principal called me, and he said, I don't want you to come back to my school anymore. And I said, why not? And he said, you are a troublemaker. And I, I didn't deny it, but, uh, right, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't understand it. I said, I don't understand. You're giving me your students who can't read, and I'm teaching them to read. I'm being very successful. I'm, I'm, I'm completing the assignments. He said, the faculty doesn't like you. And I said, well, why don't the faculty like me? And he says, well, you eat lunch with the students. You get them to call you John instead of Mr. Mackey. You're not respectful of our rules and standards. And I said, I'm teaching these kids how to read. That, isn't that really what it's all about? Yep. He said, I don't have to give you an explanation. I'm the principal. Don't come back to my school on Monday. That was the end of my entrepreneurship and education. Started Whole Foods pretty soon after that. Yeah, I think you turned out okay. <laughs> I wonder what would happen if I'd gone into education. Right. But I think you, 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 know, you make an interesting point. You talk about businesses and entrepreneurs being focused on customers. And you talk about the end goal being what the end goal is. In theory, shouldn't government view all of us as the customers? They should. Right. However, because government has a monopoly, um, they can thumb their nose at customers in a way business cannot. Business right. has to satisfy customers when it goes out of business. Yeah. Government... Uh, government they, doesn't go out of we, business. They don't. Yeah. They, you can switch parties or you can have elections, right. but... The, 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 usually the people working for government, are, they don't go out with the... Right. When the new administration comes in, there's not as much, let me just put it this way, there's not as much competition in government as there is in the private sector. And that, allow, I don't think that as a result, the public sector isn't as innovative, isn't as entrepreneurial. Yeah. I just think that's the nature of the deal. I mean, I'm, I'm conscious of my Starbucks cup up here because we're about to have, have been having, and may soon have a conversation about whether a leader from the business community would be a better person 
at the reins of government, in, in, with the reins of government in his hands than... I don't think so. Not. I don't think whether it's business or an attorney, a lawyer, I, don't, I think it's the nature of the institution. And I don't think Howard Schultz could run the government any better than Barack Obama or Donald Trump. I think it's very difficult to be president of the United States. And, and uh, uh, The I, problem is government, not the person in charge of it. The problem is the structure of the government and the way it operates and the way it should operate. You, you need to have, I didn't make judgments about because government is coercive that makes it bad. It's just the way it is. And it has its place to play in society. We need government. Right. Um, and we need a vibrant pub, private sector. We need both. We need, and by the way, or we need a vibrant nonprofit sector. Right. So I always say, if it's a, pro, if it's a problem that you can make a profit solving, it belongs in the private sector. If it doesn't work there, the next place to look is the nonprofit sector. Right. Because they'll tackle social issues that uh, neither the private sector nor the governmental sector can, can solve. And then if, if neither the private sector nor the nonprofit sector, then it belongs in government. Government is a court of last resort. It has to be. And then there are also problems like mm, global environmental problems that are not going to be solved by either the Right. private sector, the public sector, although they can cooperate on right. solutions. What, what happens, uh, John, if, if government is the mechanism to enable either business or the nonprofit sector to do what it needs to do to solve those problems? I'll give you an example. I mean, the phrase crony capitalism is called out, just to go back to that quote for a second. This is an ongoing conversation in Texas. We have had a situation in which government has made it possible for business to operate through economic incentives. Say a company wants to locate in a big city and that city's government offers economic incentives so that that company will be enticed to locate. There are, there, there's an entire strain of conservatism at the moment, this is not pejorative in saying that, it's just an observation, where th th that says basically any time government gives economic incentives to business to enable their activity or to cause them to locate someplace, that that is actually corporate welfare, it's crony capitalism, it's a bad thing. Are you sympathetic to that point of view? I'm sympathetic to that point of view, yes. Um, you are using money that's been extracted from the citizens and then giving it to businesses. So there, there is an ethical problem with that. However, that being said, if, it's a, if you have a process where it's, uh, it's competitive and it's, it's, you have bidding going on and it's ultimately non-coercive. You this, people see what happens. It's not done in a backroom deal. It's transparent. If it's transparent, correct. Right. And it's mutual win-win, and it benefits the community and the city in the long term through more tax revenues. I think that's a very uh, that's a different beast. So, so if it's really couched in terms of economic development, that may trump the concerns you have about crony capitalism. Correct. I don't think it's the same thing exactly. So, but it is. A, right. It's a slippery slope. And it can easily be corrupted because you can begin now to make campaign donations to politicians who will favor that particular economic inducement. Yeah. So it, it's one that needs, it needs very competent and very ethically oriented government to yeah. do it correctly. You mentioned transparency as a precondition of, of such a, a situation being acceptable to you or possibly good for all of us. Do you think government, generally speaking, is transparent? enough about its processes and about its intentions? Well, that's, that's kind of a loaded question. I see the headline on that one. Uh. Well, you know what? Here, here, I'll, I'll make the headline, no, government is not transparent enough. Jerky person from the media says government is not transparent. He said it. That could be the headline. I've said, said it every day for the last nine and a half years. Guess what? I'm going to keep saying it. Do you want to join me in that ditch? I'm in favor of more transparency in general yeah. for most things. How about, for, do you think business is transparent enough about its processes? on some processes, and it depends upon the business. Whole right. Foods tends to be very transparent. Yep. Do we, do we, out here in the base of customers or potential customers, have a right to ask for more transparency from the businesses we patronize? You have, surely have the right, and then you get into the idea of you know, privacy and private property, and, and uh, that's, you know, it's, not a, it's not clear cut. Right. Um, let me go back to the idea of capitalism. So this is often presented as a binary. There's for-profit and there's non-profit. Yeah. But through, co through the conscious capitalism door, which I, I am genuinely interested in and have tried to get to know, as you know, I came to the conference that you had last year and mm -hmm. have tried to understand what you're about here. Um, there is this thing called for-purpose, or this phrase for-purpose that has emerged mm -hmm. in common usage, right. which I think of as almost at the midpoint of for-profit and 
nonprofit. Do, right. do, do you believe that there is legitimately a non-binary choice there, but there's actually more ways to think about this than simply either we're in business to make money or we're in business to do good? I think the key is, if you think about it from a stakeholder model, that a business has various stakeholders. Yep. You have customers, you have employees, you have suppliers, you have investors, you have communities that you're part of, then that breaks down the binary nature of it. For example, the B Corp movement, which I'm a big supporter of, uh, kind of threads the needle here, where it sets up by law that the only fiduciary responsibility that uh, officers of a corporation have are not strictly to the investors or to the shareholders, that there are other considerations, yeah. other stakeholders that matter too. Um, and so it's, it's, it's tricky. I just think the transparency kicks in there because you want to be as transparent as possible about what you're trying to do with your institution. Yep. And if max, maximizing profits is, or I always say the best way to understand this is about purpose is yep. from what uh, Ed Freeman, uh, who's had a big influence on me, the father of stakeholder theory says, he says, look, um, my body has to produce red blood cells or I'll die. It's a simple fact. It doesn't therefore follow that because my body has to produce red blood cells that the purpose of my life is to produce red blood cells. Right. I have to do it. It's not the purpose of Necessary it. but not sufficient. Correct. Right. In business, business has to make profits or it will die. But that doesn't necessarily follow that that's why it exists to maximize profits. Right. That's a it necessary but not sufficient condition. And I think the biggest under, misunderstanding about business and capitalism in the world and why there is this, this binary, uh, tribal, because business is often judged that it's just greedy and selfish and exploitative, that it's just about the money. Yep. And people that create businesses, for the most part, know that's not true. That's a narrative that the enemies of business have put out there. And in fact, business is a great force for good in the world. Business, uh, business creates more value than all the governments and the nonprofits combined. Business is fundamentally good. It is what's lifting humanity out of poverty. And it doesn't get credit for it because the narrative about business, the intellectuals for the most part don't like business. And that's, that's we can explore that a little bit if you want to. But um, I do think we're innovating like with the B Corps so that the, it's, we need to be not profit maximizers, but purpose maximizers and value maximizers. And for the good of our society and for the good of the customers and for the good of the employees that work in the business. Business should be this, and this is what people understand because the metaphors we have are generally win-lose metaphors. Yep. Um, and in fact, business isn't win-lose. They focus way too much on competitors losing. Business is about win, 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 or what we call in conscious capitalism, win six. You should be managing your business so your customers are winning, your employees are winning, your suppliers are winning, your uh, investors are winning, and your communities are winning. You, that's, you need to find strategies that work for everybody. Right. And once you begin to reframe business, to think about it that way, you see it completely differently. You don't see it in that either or, binary profit or for profit. You're either good because you're for public service, you're a government and you're in public service, or you're a nonprofit, you're working not for money, or you're evil because you're business, you're just working for money, you're selfish and greedy and exploitative. And I mean, studies have shown that if, in movies and television that 90% of the murders are committed by business people in, in business. Is that right, on, yes. on television? And yes, in the 90%. In reality, business people, even including The Sopranos, commit less than 1% of the murders on television. I mean, on, in reality, business people are not killers. Okay. And, See, I think, that's, I think that's a better headline, honestly. <laughs> Mackie says business Mackie, people are not killers. Colin, business people are not killers. I think that's actually, I mean, that, that's pretty good. Um, I think about, but, but I think about, John, companies that are associated with doing good or associated with purpose. I think about Whole Foods. I think about Southwest Airlines. There, there are a whole class of companies that seem to sort of hover in this space. And I think we all understand without having to be told that there are differences between those types of businesses and others in terms of the philosophy of leadership 
and the disposition toward the customer base? There are businesses that are simply more conscious, that are conscious of their purposes, conscious of stakeholders, but consciousness is like on a continuum. So I would say almost all businesses are good. Almost all businesses are creating value in this world. They're doing it through voluntary exchange. No one's forced to trade with the businesses. They're not coercive. They don't have yeah. guns. We can't force you to shop at Whole Foods. HEB, I can tell you, that the hardest competitor in the whole United States we compete against. These guys are good. They're tough. You respect and them. I do, absolutely. And you they believe may, they're a for-purpose company? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, I think they're a stakeholder company. And that competition makes Whole Foods better. Mm -hmm. That's how the private sector progresses is through companies like HEB and Whole Foods struggling for customers. And you consider them to be competitors in a literal sense, but you don't feel like in order for you to win, they have to lose. I don't, exactly. That's, that's, that's why the whole competition thing is, is exaggerated, because competitors make you better. They're, in a sense, right. HEB is a stakeholder of Whole Foods market, that we can benchmark against them, we, they can set a standard against them. They're, they do innovations that we can study and copy, and we do innovations that they study and copy. And uh, you know what? The bypro but the byproduct of that is that we in Austin and we in Texas and and live in the absolute best supermarket environment from a competition standpoint that you could ever ask for. Any other state wants to fight us for that title, they will lose. Exactly, and the, right? and the point is that's really how progress gets made in capitalism, through that competition and through innovations that get, then they get copied and then they get iterated on and improved upon. Right. And that's the nature of the beast. You, you never can rest on your laurels. And I think there is a continuum of consciousness. I just, I always say almost all businesses, I won't say 100% of businesses, they're bad actors in business. I always say the worst actors in business get the headlines. But do you read about the worst actors that are doctors? Are they making the headlines? Well, doctor? sometimes. You know, Very you have, rarely. You have, you have a doctor who you know, kills a bunch of patients on the operating table. You're pretty much guaranteed to read about that doctor. No, you probably won't. Reality, most of that stuff's not being printed in the paper. The worst, sure, if somebody's a serial killer, he'll get, he'll get printed. But most doctors are shielded, and they're not getting written up about. But the, the, the worst businesses are in the headlines. So you think we tar everybody with the same brush? I think there's a bias against business in this. In, in so you, you alluded to the society. idea that intellectuals, uh, intellectuals have a have a thing about business or have a thing against business. Yeah, sure. Tell me any time in history. I'll give you the entire history of the human race. Tell me a time. Well, we only have an hour. <laughs> when intellectuals spoke well of business. They've been the class enemy of business. They business has been under the thumb of intellectuals and aristocrats for all of history. It's only with the birth of capitalism that business began to break free. And there was only at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution were we able to shake free from the domination that the intellectuals yeah. held over business, that they are hard, hard, hard at work to reassert. Do you also believe business is the enemy of government or that government views business as an enemy as well? No, I don't. I think business and governments obviously should work together for the common good. Yeah. Now there's a perception, as you know, I'm not saying it's my perception, I'm saying it's a perception that there is a coziness between business and government that some believe is the problem, is the bug and not the Because feature. it can be corrupting, yeah. right? Business has money. If they can bribe government to give special favors to certain select businesses, then you end up with a corrupt system. Do you believe that's a theory or that that actually happens? Of course it happens. Yeah. And you, of course you, the other way happens as well. Uh, government corrupts business by soliciting that type of things. You know, right. business doesn't go out of way if it's way to pay bribes generally. That costs money, but they oftentimes can't get things done in certain countries unless they offer right. special fees to expedite things. Well, walking around money in foreign countries, I understand, but here it's more mundane. Here it's simply lobbyists who lobby government on behalf of whether it's tax breaks or changes in immigration policy. I mean, I'm thinking about a session a couple sessions ago at the legislature when there was discussion of immigration policy that would have had an impact on workforce. And I remember a couple of very big companies in Texas, the kind you would not have imagined to behave anything other than conservatively, lobbying against the tightening up of immigration policies because there was a concern about future, hell, current workforce. You know, sometimes business does need to put itself in the position of lobbying government because it believes that if government acts in a certain way, it will impede the ability of them it's, to do business. It's all about, it's all about 
whether you're working for just the short-term interest of your business or you're working for the better good of the whole society. Right. Those are different situations completely. Let me go pre-Amazon. So before Amazon got into the picture, did Whole Foods employ lobbyists? No. To work with government? No. So if you had any issues related to policy, whether it was tax policy or economic We're just grocers. Or, we just wanted to sell healthy food it. to people. <laughs> so there was, no, there was no way in which government at the state or local level or federal level could do anything as far as you were concerned that would impact your business enough that you felt the need to engage. We never did, we never did engage. Whether yeah. if, if Whole Foods, you know, probably, you know, most of the time, corporations don't engage with business until they start getting beat up, and then they think, I got to go, got to protect, our, I got to protect the company, right? And so then they begin to engage. Yeah. Um, Whole Foods was being, uh, we were getting roughed up when we were trying to acquire Wild Oats by the FTC. We spent thirty that, million dollars right. in legal fees because they right. were suing. To, we were a monopoly. Did you know that? <laughs> that. We, were, we had a monopoly of the premium national organic supermarket category. We had a monopoly of that because we were the only ones. We created ourselves, and we had a monopoly of ourselves. Right. And, uh, and then some people copied us. And, and, uh, but so I did go talk to, uh, I talked to some senators and people. I went down myself. I didn't hire any lobbyists. I just went down there and met with senators and pe people like that to explain what was happening and to... And to uh, and we didn't actually get a settlement with the FTC until we did. Well, we did that until I did that until we went and talked with people, and they began to call the FTC and right. basically said, "Why are you? Why are you doing this?" Yeah. So, I think businesses ultimately would prefer to invest their money in growth, but they're oftentimes uh, no choice but to engage. Sometimes they have no choice but to engage. If you get as right. big as Amazon or Google or uh, governments, or they're they're everywhere. And you gotta, you can't, got to can't avoid them. You cannot avoid them. So you got to do right. it. A, you got to be smart about it. Sometimes when business engages with government, it's prophylactic, right? Sometimes you're trying to prevent something from happening. But sometimes when business decides to get into this discussion, it's because government is not doing something, and companies like Whole Foods, which may believe in purpose and in advancing the interests of the community, say, "Government's not getting in here. We're going to get in here." One of the things that's been interesting to me is to watch the climate discussion over the last couple of years. Oh, I don't talk about climate change. Probably. Oh, is that it? <laughs> I was trying so hard not to talk about sex that I thought I would talk about climate. <laughs> You'd I mean, be a hell of a Playboy interview, wouldn't you, actually? Well, I mean, if you talk about issues that are very polarizing for people, right. you end up, people get mad at you. And, you right. know, I mean, you can't win. You can't. I guess I'm not, I'm not asking you, actually, John, as far as it goes, to talk to me about your view of climate. I'm asking you more in the realm of, is it appropriate for companies to enter that conversation about policy if and when government decides to take a pass. Is it appropriate? I mean, if businesses want to do that, I think they should have the freedom to do that if they, if they are willing to pay the price for it. And is there I a mean, price to be paid? I mean, you've you got the Starbucks cup over there. So, I do. So before Howard Schultz uh, left Starbucks, he was taking on a lot of social issues like... Uh, race. Race, for example. Right. And... That had, a blow, that had a blowback to Starbucks. Their comps were affected. A lot of people resented that and didn't like it, didn't think it was appropriate. So it was courageous, but was it absolutely in the best interest of his business or not? I'm not sure it was. So, so there might, might be consequences. I mean, as you correctly point out, I mean, we laugh about it, but it's, it's true as far as it goes, that if you take a position on something, somebody is going to disagree with you. Of course. And that person could be a current customer, that person could be a future customer. So from the perspective of business, it is better not to get out too far on those issues because there is a real risk to well, you. When I learned the painful back in 2009 when I right. wrote an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal talking about health care, I was shocked because we were, we were boycotted all over the United States. Uh, we had people in front of our stores protesting. Right. Um, I got... Uh, I just, I, I did not make a distinction back then between, this is my personal opinion. I just, I just entered my personal opinion. It's not speaking for Whole Foods Market. This is just me. This is John Mackey speaking what he thinks. Yeah. People could not make a separation between Whole Foods and me. So they, I, I learned that very painfully Should 10, they have been able to? Ago. I mean, you're, you're the CEO of a big company that you started. I'm just asking reasonably, should people have, have, have been able to make that distinction? You know, what I believe people should eat is not what Whole Foods sells. 
I mean, I'm a vegan, and I'm a very strict vegan, and I'm, I'm, I'm plant-based. I try to avoid oil, try to avoid refined sugars, refined grains, things like that. We sell all those things at Whole Foods. And am I to force my values on everyone else? Right, that works for you. It shouldn't have to work for the rest of us. Exactly. Right. And so I thought that I was issuing my own opinion. I wasn't speaking for the company. But no distinction was made, and Whole Foods paid a hefty price for it. So that was a real, I learned a valuable lesson 10 years ago, and I haven't done it since. First time in last I've time received many requests to write op-ed pieces since then. And, uh, well, I, bet, I bet you have. I right? have. <laughs> come, come back to the party. Um, let me ask you about a couple things that are actually divorced from the question of politics or government, but are more about, well, no, no, I'm not letting you off the hook that easily, <laughs> buddy, um, since we're so intimate. Um, I want to ask you about some, some big facts of life in Texas that are driving where this state, and by implication, because we're a leading indicator for the country, where the country is going. And they actually do have policy implications indirectly because they're the inputs that produce outputs at a capital like ours. The first is that the population of Texas is growing precipitously right before our eyes. 28.3 million people in Texas today going to 54 million by 2050. So in 30 years, the population of Texas is going to double. From your perspective as a business owner, does the precipitous population growth give you reason to rethink your strategy? Does it think about how you interact with the world around you, the communities you're in? What does that, what does that do for you as an input? I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Um, I mean, it'll, we'll be able to open up more stores. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is it, is it as straight ahead as more people equals more potential customers? I'll be dead more in 2050 markets? almost assuredly, so it'll be, it'll be have to well, it'll if live you, beyond if me. If you're a vegan, you may outlive all the rest of us. That's I don't know. probably actually. true. Your but... <laughs> lack of oils will cause you to live forever. But, um, but seriously, so, so, so a demographic inevitability like the growth of population in a place like Texas, where you do, after all, do, I mean, I counted up, you've got five stores in Austin, you've got five in Houston, you've got five in Dallas, you've got a couple, three in San Antonio. You've obviously got you know, a lot of interest in Texas, even though the company has grown significantly beyond Texas. Does population growth here or elsewhere necessarily drive your thinking about the way you operate your business, the way you Well, it does. I mean, because I just what I just said, I mean... Whole Foods market does not appeal to everyone. It appeals to only a certain segment of the population. Right. And so we tend to come, we're in, there's a reason why we're in Austin and not in, say, uh, San Marcos. Or Dieball, right, or Muleshoe, yeah. right? Yeah. However, if those communities grow to get to a sufficient population base where we can open a store, we will. Right. So You are largely an urban we have business. What's the biggest state in the United States? California. Right. We have the most stores in California. And, yeah. uh, but the other big states, New York, Texas, Florida, we have a lot of stores in there as well. Yes. We, don't have, we have zero stores in North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, for example. Not really whole food states. There are just not enough people. It's not that they're not a whole food state. That's a bad headline. Mackey says Montana, <laughs> not a whole food state. We're, Mackey, we're just not that into you, North Dakota. <laughs> right. So it's yeah. about... It's about it's having, a, it's having enough potential customers for, to open a store that will be successful. Right. So it's not really about urban versus rural or urban versus exurban. It's more about are there people Well, if there's enough people, people, it'll be urban. Right. So, 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 the second, so, so that's the second input I want to put before you is not only is Texas population growing, but it is also becoming rapidly more urban. At least I'm thinking about our own situation. We now have six of the 20 largest cities in the country in Texas, more than any other state. And that's a trend line that's not reversing. I think 75% of the population of the state two years ago lived east of I-35. Now it's 77%. So there's, you're not putting stores in Die Ball or Mule Shoe or Dime Box, in part because they're not populated. But and totally because totally, they're not yeah. populated. Right, yeah. But the, so the fact that we're becoming more urban and that the urban centers are growing in population is from the perspective of, of a business that does well in those heavily populated, densely populated areas. That's a positive thing for you, right? Yeah. And it doesn't cause you to think about this any differently other than we have more opportunity here that we can potentially leverage. I mean, I have to say, I'm like, I'm a Texan. I was born in Houston. I've grown up in Texas. Right. I'm a Texan. I love Texas. So for the record, that's a good headline. Mackie loves Texas. <laughs> but uh, uh, I mean, I always tell people when I travel, because people have all these stereotypes about Texas, I say, did you know Texas is bigger than Germany or France? It has more population than Australia. That if it yep. was a standalone economy, it depends on your statistics. Tenth, tenth. So tenth to thirteenth, depending tenth. on which yep. one you're looking at. Yep. 
and people don't realize that. So uh, we have a, we're geographically diverse, uh, depending on what part of the state. You know, people have these stereotypes that it's kind of like West Texas and cowboys and the Texas and myth, or, right? It's, it's oil wells. It's or, an urban state, really. It's, yeah. it's not a not a rural. And state. Texas is the third leading energy producer in the world now. I think something like that, right. pretty close and, to but, it. But and number one in the country, most crude oil yeah. of any of any state. So. Um, it's no surprise Texas is growing. We also have, frankly, we have no income, state income taxes. It's usually ranked number one to number three as a friendly place for business. And, and that, that low tax burden has been a positive for your business? Our state government yeah. only meets every other year. Yeah, see, I mean, it's a miracle you and I, You and I differ on this. I know you'd like the legislature to be in session Two days every 140, or you know, whatever it is. Maybe a little more. Right. Two days that. every 140 years. We would like them to be in session always. Um, that's good for my business, then maybe not your business. <laughs> the low tax burden that you mentioned is, is a positive, not just for your business, but for the business environment. If you look at the states yeah. that have the lowest taxes, right. Florida, Texas, right. the, the states like that, uh, Washington, where Amazon, Seattle, those states are growing, and Nevada, they're growing very rapidly. Yeah. People but, are, I mean, they're, they're fleeing the high tax states. Do you worry, though, John, that the underside of that conversation, I mean, I will absolutely stipulate what you just said, but that the underside of that is that in a state that is growing as quickly as Texas, there's a physical and social infrastructure implication to being low tax. If you're low tax, you're almost always low service. And then the question is, do you have adequate public education, health care, transportation, clean air, clean water, all that, for a state of 28.3 million, let alone for 54 million. So are there trade-offs? More people results in more tax revenues as well. So um, it's not necessarily that Texas has low, it's all, Texas, I'm not, Texas doesn't rank absolutely at the bottom in terms of tax. Uh, I think it's 43rd or 44th in tax burden among the 50 states. Yeah. So it's not an absolute bottom on tax burden. Right. Still, we still have a way to go, right? That's so, it. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, of course, we need to provide clean air and clean water and good public services. And then, yep. then you have the debates about how much tax money do you need to do that with. Uh, right. I would say that, um, based on my experience, the high tax states don't necessarily have better services. Right. So... Uh, Depends on the, yeah. depends on the state. Let me ask you about the third driver, because and I'm obsessed at the moment with this and maybe over time with this. How much is, time we got left oh, here? <laughs> much more than you want, No, I we should you. be in, we, by, you said by one o'clock, it's 12.42, we should be in audience questions. We will be in audience point. questions, and well, you know, exactly. Right. This is, this is my flagship store, not yours. Well, we'll get there in a second. Um, uh, de demographic inevitability, the fact that the population is not only growing but also changing dynamically. It's 43% Anglo now, 40% Hispanic, will be turning into a Hispanic majority state in Texas within about the next 20 years. Does the change in the composition of the population in any way make you think about your business differently? It, no, because these changes occur incrementally over time and you just gradually adjust. Yeah. You, don't, you don't really have to... We're not planning 20 years in advance. I mean, the stores change every day. They change as customer, customers vote. They vote with their pocketbooks. They vote for products. Products that sell better, you put more in. So whatever the composition of the population, uh, ethically, racially, in text or anyplace else, it's just a, it's a changing customer base, but business operates in a way that react, reacts to that, but doesn't necessarily change dramatically. I mean, you can anticipate it and plan for it. Yeah. It's just when you're in the when you're in the food business, you can always change the internal part of your store and re yeah. remodel it as as demographically it shifts and changes. Yeah. Texas is also a state that's getting a lot younger as it as we move forward in terms of the percentage of the population. I was I was interested to see that one of the in the next statewide elections in Texas that was my frame for it. 2022, one out of every three eligible voters in Texas will be under the age of 30. That's, I mean, it's interesting to think well, about That's scary. Well, or not. I mean, I, I, th I think of it as an interesting element to the population of Texas because we're talking about potentially for a business like yours, a lot of young people who are moving into positions of leadership, and those are your future customers, right? Maybe they're your current customers. They are, absolutely. Yeah. So if you're targeting a customer base that is younger as opposed to a customer base, that also maybe makes you think a little bit about the way. I hate that word target. You ever think about it? Really, business doesn't target things. Target comes from a, a, a gun metaphor, right? Or we're not targeting anybody. We're not. We're we're uh, we're trying to serve them. So we're 
looking to serve people. So I just, I always have to question language because the language used about business is usually very unflattering. Well, it's also used about politics in Fairly, too. We target voters. I mean, it's not unique to business, but it's unfair all around, you think? I think so. It's a bad metaphor. Okay. Well, since I'm out of good metaphors, let's go to audience questions. Um, we have microphones here in the front. Please line up, and if you have questions, you're welcome to join us in the conversation. I will make two requests of you. One is ask a question, don't make a speech. Uh, and the second thing is, we just want to get as many people in as possible. Sure. And then the second thing is, let's, in the spirit of this conversation, let's be civil to one another. That's all I ask. So, sir, we'll go, we'll go back and forth. Sir. Hi, uh, my name is Matt Apsher. I'm with Environment Texas. And you've talked a lot about corporate citizenship and stake, uh, stakeholder theory in this talk. Mm -hmm. And as a vegan yourself, uh, I'm sure you know that some of the most uh, environmentally impactful products on your shelves are your meats. Mm -hmm. Yet, if I'm not mistaken, uh, two of your largest suppliers are Tyson and Cargill, which also happen to be two of the largest uh, polluters uh, in Th the those aren't, those are not two of our largest suppliers. Oh. Do we buy anything from them? Yeah. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, but uh, my question is, as a good corporate, corporate citizen yourself, what is uh, Whole Foods doing to promote sustainability throughout your supply chain? You know, I always say that one of the hardest things about being in business is business is held to this standard of perfection. So it's I think it's unfair because business has to respond to the marketplace as it finds it. And I, because, I, you know, I'm 100% I'm plant-based. My very first store, Safer Way, here on 8th and Rio Grande, was a vegetarian store. And I always like to say, whole, Safer Way did not sell any meat. It didn't sell any chicken. It didn't sell any sugar. It didn't sell any white flour. It did almost no business. <laughs> right. We, we didn't sell any coffee. We were very, very pure. And... When we went to Whole Foods and we started selling coffee and meat and uh, uh, beer and wine, uh, we were the highest volume natural food store in the United States like right. within a few months of opening because we met the market where we found C it. Customers told you that you had made the right decision to expand. So right. Whole Foods market cannot be 100% pure. It's, it's, we do the best that we can. We do a lot of things for sustainability. So, um, I, I, I mean... We do, we, we have literally tens of thousands of suppliers to our company. It's, I always think it's unfair to ask a business to hold absolutely every one of its suppliers up to some type of, uh, um, well, activist standard because Whole Foods Market is attacked by uh, every kind of activist you can possibly imagine from animal rights to climate change activists to... Uh, <laughs> percentage of women in leadership positions, it's, it's, it's just under continual activism uh, churn. Do you begrudge those people their right to advocate for no, their of course interests? not. Right. I'm merely saying I cannot answer his question satisfactorily because I cannot account for probably the 30,000 suppliers we deal with. It's an impossible request to ask for business. All I can do is deal with the ethics of what Whole Foods Market does. I cannot... I cannot control or police the ethics of everybody else that trades with us. It's, it's, an, it's an impossible request, and it's impossible to get complete purity in our supply chain. Um, and that's just a simple fact. If we tried to do it, we would ruin our business and go bankrupt. Thank you. A guy with a baby is certainly going to ask the meanest question. Because <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. As a father, I can tell he's already softened up here. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's, he's insulating himself from your... Okay, go ahead. This is a, a great follow-up question. With the growing population and the need to feed that population, what are your thoughts personally or from the perspective of Whole Foods on alternative proteins like edible insects, such as the cricket protein bars that just launched in HEB, or the recent approvals to allow insects to be used as a livestock feed? I didn't expect we were going to get an insect question. <laughs> I mean, um, I have personally will not be eating insects, but uh, I... That's the headline. <laughs> we got there finally. That's the headline. But I have no objection to, if people want to, if, if that's the market for edible insects, no doubt Whole Foods will be in it. Um, if cannabis is ever passed in Texas, chances are good that um, 
grocery stores will be selling that too. So you just, you just never know what happens over time um, with markets. They change and evolve. And I've seen a lot of evolution in the 40 years I've been in business. It's very different today than it was 40 years ago. It's fascinating. Do you think you're more likely to be selling buds or pot brownies faster? Which one? Let's see what happens with the uh, market and the government regulations over time. I am about to say, this is Texas. I would say bugs, probably. I'm going to just, I'm going to go with bugs. <laughs> Sir. All right. John, thank you for being here. My name is Eugene Pei. So we've read the New York Times op-ed about the culture at Amazon and then also um, Harvard Business Case uh, on Whole Foods and the organization organizational culture there. Mm -hmm. So how has the acquisition impacted, influence, changed Whole Foods' uh, corporate vision as well as culture? Well, uh, I can't, I mean, if you talk to anybody at Amazon about the New York Times piece, they think it was a total hatchet job. So, uh, but I don't talk about Amazon publicly because, you know, if you, I, I can talk about Whole Foods, but you have questions about Amazon per se, you should direct. I mean, sometimes I got out in public and people have these objections to Amazon and why yeah. didn't my book come I get, faster? I get kind of right? hijacked. Yeah. No, not that kind of, you know. <laughs> why are they doing facial recognition technologies and that's going to aid totalitarian control right. of populations? It's like, what? Uh, <laughs> go talk to them about that. Right. I have nothing to do with facial recognition, not in, not in the grocery department. Um, so now I lost my train of thought. But, but, so could, but you, could, you, oh. could you throw out the top half of the question and just talk about whether the culture of Whole Foods today is different than it was five years ago? So the best way... The, the, because this is a question I get asked all the time, is, is Whole Foods going to change in the merger with Amazon? And I always say that the best way to understand a big merger between two big companies is kind of like a marriage. And the marriage is a good metaphor to understand it because they proposed, we accepted, brought a nice dowry to the marriage. <laughs> and, uh, and now, in a healthy marriage, you may not want to change, but you do change. Yeah. In a good marriage, anybody that's here that's married, tell me you didn't change, and I'll tell you somebody that's either divorced or heading to divorce. <laughs> because you will change, and you will evolve, but, there, but so far in the merger, the merger's been great for Whole Foods. Amazon's been very respectful of our culture. And they're not coercing us to do things. They are seducing us to do things. <laughs> Meaning, they come up with really good things that make our company better and offer it to us, and we accept it. So it's kind of a... a we're changing because we want to change, because we want to take the best of Amazon on. They're, and th this is something people don't understand. Amazon does not want to destroy our culture. They'd be throwing away Why'd most of it. Why'd they buy it then? Why'd they buy it for, exactly. So the merger's going well, very well for us. We're very excited about it. We're, we're a better company than we were prior to the merger, and I believe we'll be a better company than we are today, three or four years from now. Thank you. Ma'am. Hello, thank you. I'm Sarah Meyer, and I hear you talk about the continuation of the continuum of consciousness. Right. And do you see practices in the private sector helping to drive that continuum of consciousness and ways that they're partnering with institutions, you know, top tier business schools like McCombs and also with other industry partners? Good question, and the answer is yes. I mean, uh, consciousness is rapidly evolving, not just in business, but across the, across the planet. If you just look where the world is today. One of the things that unfortunately, I, so many young people today are not students of history, or the only students of history they ever read was the people's history of the United States. And so they're aware of the failings of, of the United States historically. But in fact, if you study where we were, I mean, 150 years ago, um, or 155 years ago, slavery, for example, was still legal in half, of the, half the states. If you go back 100 years ago, women didn't have the right to vote. If you go back 50 years ago, there was almost no environmental consciousness at all. And in my lifetime, I was born when there were Jim Crow laws in the South. Consciousness is evolving at a, never has it evolved as rapidly as evolving right now. As people are dissatisfied because the younger people today are starting out at a higher level of consciousness and they yep. can't understand why the rest of the world isn't there right now. Yep. And they get angry and frustrated about it. Uh, but if you look at it in a historical context, corporations are evolving at breakneck speed. It's astounding and, and it's accelerating. And it's 
It's discontinuous change, so it's painful. Is it and good, though, in the end? you think it's positive? Of course. Yeah. I mean... Uh, because not, you would acknowledge not all change is positive, right? It's inevitable. Changes in consciousness advancing is good. There's less... You know, the, the one book I try to get people to read today, if people ask me, John, what's one book I should read? You have to read Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker because it's the most optimistic book. It's, it's, it's been written in a long time. He just documents the great progress humanity has made in the last hundred yep. years. And this is never, there's never been a better time to be alive than right now. This is the, I, you can have all of history. When has it ever been better than it is right now? This is the best humanity's ever had. And we can make it better. That's what conscious capitalism is trying to do, make it better. But you have to appreciate where we are, not for complacency's sake, but just so you'll be a little bit more patient and not make demands that can't be changed overnight. Right. And the challenge for young people is to solve the problems my generation couldn't solve. I can tell you the world was really screwed up when I arrived here. And, and it'll be really screwed and, up when I leave here. Less, less but screwed I've done up what now. I can to make it a better place. You think it's less screwed up now? Absolutely. Right. You just have to see how bad it was b back then. Back then, ma'am. Hi, I'm Carson Quinn. Thank you for being here. Um, with the Amazon merger, how did that impact the closure of the 365 oh, store nothing, concept? Nothing to do with it. First of all, the stores are not closing. 365 stores are not closing. We opened 12 of them. They're all, they're, they're all successful. They're just not as successful as a Whole Foods Market standalone store. We gave it a fair test. We've done 12 stores. And we're going to do other formats. We're going to, I'm not going to tell you what they are. That would be the headline today if I told you some of the stuff we were going to do in the future. But we're going to do other formats as well. This one, though, we gave it a fair test, you know, three or four years, 12 stores. It, it, it doesn't, it's just not as financially as successful model as the Whole Foods Market store. Amazon had nothing to do with it. Everything Amazon gets blamed for are lies. And pretty much everything they're getting credit for are also not true. Um, Whole Foods is pretty much still make, calling all the shots for Whole Foods. We're making these decisions. Amazon's supporting us. They're, right. not, they're not the puppet master and, and they're, you know, pulling all the strings. This is a marriage. It's a partnership. And they're helping us get better. They're not uh, commanding us to do everything. Got it. It's the biggest misunderstanding out there. Ma'am. Hi. To be honest, you might have just answered this, but my question was going to be if you could choose one book to put into the student curriculum across the world, what would it be? So Pinker. you could just maybe read Stephen it. Pink, well, Conscious Capitalism, but Stephen Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now. Okay. Okay. Sir, please must read that book. Hi, uh, Conrad Bufardo, Nora Brown Rock, honey. Uh, I want to, one, uh, thank you for uh, everything you did to help our company get started because you were the first grocery store that we got into. And, and so that was cool. Uh, second question is, in retirement, do you plan to do uh, more uh, teaching? Uh, and I'm not really talking about it at the university level. I'm talking about community. No university would ever hire me, I assure you. Well, I can tell you as an entrepreneur myself, I got kicked I'm out of an elementary school. Yeah, but okay? I, think, I, <laughs> I, I think your troublemaking back then has been forgiven. And by I the think. way, I was a public school teacher I just as hope well. I survived I this got, conversation today. I, well, you I, got about this one may minute. be my last public talk. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm asking because I was a public school teacher as well, and I had a yeah. similar issue with the principal as well, and, and that's how I got into starting. So what will, what, what will you do when you retire? Yeah. Do you, have you thought about that, what you want to do next? I'm not retiring any time in the immediate future, so um, A, I'm going to have a lot of fun, and, uh, but I'm, I'm a very intense, serious guy, so I'm going to still be doing cool stuff. And I'm, gonna, I'm on five nonprofit boards right now, and I'll have a nonprofit thing I'm doing and, and uh, I'll serve on some other boards. And, yeah. uh, but and I will also be working with young entrepreneurs. I love young people. They're alive. They don't yet know what they can't do and they don't, they can think outside the box. So They I'm, haven't learned bad habits. They have to unlearn like oh, those of us who are a little bit older. It's true. Right. Yeah. yeah. Last question. Hi. Thank oh, you for being here. Not. Uh, so my question is, as a leader, it's important to stay, uh, to have values that you hold constant throughout your entire professional career. So as an undergraduate student and an entrepreneur myself, what values have you hold constant throughout your career? You know, it's interesting because that gives me a chance to plug my next book, which, <laughs> which is in process. Uh, plug away. It's the 12 Virtues of a Conscious Leader. Oh. And not the 12 principles, not the 12 values, not the 12 rules, the virtues. 
For example, leading with love, integrity in all things, passion for purpose. These are some of the virtues we'll be talking about in the book. Because virtues are skill. These are character traits that you have to develop. They're not given to you automatically. You have to work at it. So some of the values that I hold absolutely, you know, that, that are, are, are virtues that I've had to struggle with and grow and get better with. And I've named three of them. I, I just think integrity is so important because with integrity comes honesty, authenticity, and trust. And so integrity is absolutely very important. Love is very important. Love is largely in the corporate closet. And I, I go into detail about why that is because of the, the metaphors people use to think about business are not conducive to love. It's in the corporate closet. Yeah. And so I really believe you should release, get free love into your organization. I believe in that. Uh, I really, really believe you, should, you have to be courageous and you have to cultivate courage in something you develop over time. Is that the kind of values that you're interested in? Okay, good. I think ending on love and integrity is a pretty good place to stop. Um, yeah. I know you don't like a good this. place to start. I know you don't like this sort of thing, <laughs> but you're very good at it. And uh, we are benefiting all from hearing from you talk about this stuff. So Thanks, Evan. You're, you're such, you have such a quick mind, and you ask such difficult questions. I, I hope I didn't... I hope I was able to extricate myself from most of them, but... I, 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 uh, I, I think you did okay. Uh, please give John Mackey a big hand. Thank, Thank you, Dean. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you again. Thanks, Good luck.